Hello, participants. Uh, we are saying you hello from sunny Geneva today and uh, happy Ramadan to all Muslim countries. Uh, we know that um, holiday is coming. My name is Ina. I'm working for admission departments uh, in University of Business and International Studies here in Geneva headquarters campus and uh, I'm responsible for local and international admissions. Today we have uh, uh, one of our top professors uh, spending this webinar with you and I'm presenting you to Arash Golnam who will uh, speak to you about um, design thinking and will give you uh, necessary tools uh, for the skills that you need everywhere in study and work environment. And I'll get back to you just after his lecture to reply some questions. Thank you so much and uh, applauses to you, dear professor, please. Have a word. Hello, everyone. This is Arash, and I'm speaking to you from Lausanne, Switzerland. I hope you're all doing well. Um, I'll be sharing with you some ideas about design thinking, some uh personal thoughts and some experiences i've had as an educator and as a learner and i will be trying to also give you an idea about the type of the classes that we try to run um at ubis so that's the agenda for for today and we'll see how successful we will be and if you got any questions please don't hesitate to post your questions in the chat box um we will get back to them and I will definitely make sure I leave some time for questions and answers as well. So here it is. I'm going to start my presentation and please don't do not hesitate to write down your questions as we go ahead. All right. Um, what is this topic? What is design thinking? And why do I care about it? And why should you care about this topic? What do you, what do you, what do you want to talk about today? Um, first of all, some background about me. The picture on the left is me going to school at the age of six, seven. So one of the first days of school. And then the picture on the right is me again as a student, but this time 30 years later. Um, um sorry to disturb but uh, we don't see the pictures we just see the first uh, page of the presentation do you see now anything no it's still the first page uh, let me see um do you see something different now do you see the picture um no but i guess for people it works i will just refresh my page Probably it works for them. Sorry. So is it okay for everyone? Okay, apparently it's working. Yeah, all right. So we go ahead. So back to the beginning. All right. So um, so on the left, I'm going to school at the age of six, seven. And then on the right side, I'm also a student again. So I've been a student for almost uh, 30 years of my life since the first day. And I've had three major highlights or three sets of important questions uh, along the way as a learner, as an educator as well. So today I want to share these questions with you and the relationship they have with design. So here is my journey as a learner. I did industrial engineering and then some management um, in, in my master's of studies, first master's of studies. And then I did uh, technology management for my PhD at uh, uh, Polytechnic University here in Switzerland and Lausanne. Then I did a second master's in system dynamics, which is mathematical simulation of complex and adaptive systems. And finally, now I'm a student of depth psychology. And um, in a couple of years from now, I will be a psychoanalyst. So what is what is design and why is it important? If we think about the word design, um, one of the best sentences that comes to my mind is by a British architect who says, the job of a designer is to give the client not what he wants, but what he never dreamed he wanted. And when he gets it, he recognizes it as something he wanted all the time. So there is, there is a lot of meaning there for me because 
most of us think that designing is going around asking people what they want, asking them to fill out some questionnaires, and then you somehow develop those information into a product or a service, and that becomes uh, a design project. But what um, Sir Dennis Latson is saying is that we actually give the client something that he never thought he wanted. So we have to go and access some source of information which is more profound, which is not something that is accessible even to the clients. But once you go and you have that information and insight and you come back and you somehow transform that into a service or a product, that's the moment they realize, oh my God, this is something that I wanted. And I've been looking for it my whole, my whole life, but I didn't know how to actually get it. So today I want to talk to you about some ideas where we can touch base with that uh, design process that can give us that, some, that, that insight. The word design has a root that is somehow um, common to some other words like significance, signify, designate. So as we can see, this word is somehow in a close proximity semantically with some other words. And all of them are about somehow importance, significance, meaning. The word signify means to give meaning. In French, we say signification means meaning of something. So design is about creating meaning creating importance, creating significance for people. This is something important. No, it's not about creation of products or services. It's about creation of meaning and importance, perhaps through products or services. So that's another point that we should keep in mind. Now, instead of saying, what is design? I like the question, when is design? So when is design? Design, in my opinion, happens when we have three factors working at the same time. So it, it happens at the interplay of three things. Craft, which is learning from experience through iteration. Science, which is induction or deduction. I've just put induction here. So following a scientific method, making measurements, um, somehow a systematic method of observation and translating our observations into measurements, translating our measurements into information, and then somehow deducing some ideas about the behavior of the phenomenon that we are dealing with. That's the scientific part. And then there's art. Art is about intuition, which means you somehow gather information about your environment from a source apart from your your five sensory inputs. So we have touch, sight, smell, hearing, and, um, uh, and uh, what do we have? Touch, smell, sight, hearing, uh, hearing. And if you can manage to get some information from a source beyond these senses, not only through these senses, or as we call it, the sixth sense, some extra sensory perception, that is art. So that is going to a place that is unknown and then coming back with an idea. But that idea does not come from direct observation and direct perception through your sensory inputs. So design happens at the, uh, let's say, overlap between these three disciplines, we can say. So there is a relationship like this. We have craft, science, and art. And then design is the thing that somehow derives them. And these, each of these, let's say, um, gears, they will also, when they, are, when they move, they start to move the other ones. So once you start designing, your craft skills improve, your scientific skills improve, and your artistic intuition also improves. So it's, design is a very good way of developing some, um, let's say, uh, skills that are, uh, not only one dimensional, but include different, let's say, uh, sources of skills and capacities that can help us in many different things. So one other way I look, I, I like to represent this is that once you start uh, designing, you engage your scientific, artistic and craft 
skills at the same time. And as you keep on doing design, keep on creating things which are meaningful and significant for some audience and yourself, this overlap increases. So somehow you learn how to combine these three factors together in a better way. So there is a synergy that's, create, that's, that's created between them. You go from a point of separation when these three things are separated or maybe not even fully developed to a point where they become a unit. They are integrated in one, let's say, uh, set of skill that you cannot differentiate which aspect it is anymore. So uh, after this, I want to say that design is interdisciplinary. It's about connecting disciplines. As we said, design is about combination of art, combination of science, combination of craft, experience, intuition, induction, deduction. So it somehow um, has properties that are interdisciplinary in nature. So it's not about one field. It's about how to connect different fields, how to understand the connection and the interplay between a variety of different fields. But there's a very important but here. Um, our educational system is not interdisciplinary. We have a total of 8,000 disciplines. And these 8,000 dis 8, disciplines, this is, I just want you to think about this. There was a time, if you go back in time, we had like five disciplines. We had medicine, for instance, we had poetry and literature, we had astronomy, and uh, so, so geometry probably, and mathematics, and so on and so forth. But now we have 8,000 of these. And every day there is more uh, disciplines popping up. Um, so there is uh, an era of hyper-specialization. You know, people develop new things, but these new things are not connected to each other anymore. At universities, you can see that different departments or people within the same department have a difficult time connecting to each other and somehow co-creating things together. These eight disciplines uh, use 50,000 uh, scientific outlets for putting out, uh, let's say, their uh, scientific products or their findings or research outputs. 50,000 journals are there. And these are ISI index journals, the journals that have a very high level of, uh, let's say, academic standard. Otherwise, we have, um, I can say, at least 150,000 journals out there, which are not all ISI indexed. And then there is around a million articles published a year, a million articles published in those journals a year. So there is the education system in terms of, instead of uh, focusing on the connections, interrelationships, synergies, is somehow looking at how to create new disciplines, how to dig deeper and deeper and deeper into one discipline until it's disconnected from anything around it. That's one of the problems that we have. Then uh, from childhood, we always have these games to play, you know, find differences between things. You know, you have seen these in, in magazines and journals that we are asked to find differences instead of finding meaningful similarities between seemingly different phenomena, we try to find meaningless differences between things. So this is something that from childhood uh, we have been trained to do, but no one has asked us to find a meaningful similarity between two things that are seemingly very, very different. Um, so my argument so far is that design is very important in creating some uh, interdisciplinary uh, skills and capacities within us. But the education system does not equip us with the tools and the mindset required to embrace this uh, type of discipline. And this is the story of the elephant in the dark or the elephant and the blind man, that the blind man touch different parts of the elephant, but they don't see the total picture. And the, the picture they develop of the elephant is something that does not resemble the reality of what is. There is a, this is a statement by one of my favorite um, uh, mathematicians, uh, Alfred North Whitehead. He says, the result of teaching small parts of a large number of, number of subjects is the passive reception of disconnected ideas. It's very meaningful. The passive reception of disconnected ideas. So what we go through in, in school most of the times is we sit there 
and there's there's a professor a teacher who comes and then presents us with a number of concepts without us having a chance of experiencing those somehow um, having an intimate intellectual relationship and experiential relationship with those concepts or notions we just sit there and we absorb disconnected ideas that we can't do anything with afterwards so what he's proposing is that let the main ideas which are introduced in education be few and important and let them be known into every combination possible. So this is very important. So start learning one thing. Second thing that you learn, try to see how it connects to the first one. Third thing, how it connects to the second one and to the first one. Whenever you add something, somehow try to see how it's connected. Again, he is talking about the importance of inner connections and interrelationships, uh, something that is missing in education. One, one analogy that one of my favorite uh, management scholars uses is that we are given um, an IKEA furniture in box, but we don't have any instruction to assemble it. This is what education does to us. So there is a whole bunch of ideas we learn from different courses, but then at the end of the day, there is no user manual in order to see how these ideas connect and how we can create a coherent whole out of these ideas. So one statement here that is quite funny is that my problem is that when I face a problem, I don't know what class I am in. We talk about project management, we talk about finance, we talk about, um, let's say, organizational behavior in different courses. But then in reality, when you see a problem, it, it has different dimensions to it. And this problem is not related to only one discipline, to one, one course, to one concept. It's always a combination and an overlap of many different fields, but this is something that we're not trained in. One exercise I do with my students is that I give them a, some construction bricks and two bottles of water, so big ones, and I ask them to build a bridge that can allow the bottles to pass underneath it and can also withstand the weight of the bottles above it, upon it. So what most of the students do, like this example, they build the columns, the pillars, very quickly. And then they start wondering, now, how can we connect them? And almost all of them fail in doing so. Because as you are building the pillars, you have to think about the connection. When you're up there, it's already too late to do this. And this is another thing that we have to consider. If we want to have interdisciplinary education, it has to be designed from ground up. So we cannot just teach different things. And at the end of the day, there's one course is, OK, now let's try to connect everything together. We have to be able to uh, embed that into the design of curricula from the beginning of uh, the education that we have. But once they know how to tackle this problem, they start building amazing things. The students are very smart. and. Um, if you give them the right tools and the right mindset, they can create extraordinary results. This is a this is a picture from one of my one of my courses that the students built something that not only could withstand the weight of bottles, but one of the students uh, could also stand on it. But they didn't uh, put the let's say the chubbiest students. They chose the the smallest student. So that but still that was an amazing um, accomplishment from what they had over there to what they built over here. Um, one personal story for you is that when I was a student um, doing my bachelor's studies, my GPA was falling dramatically. You know, I, I started with a very high level of motivation. And then as each year went by, I could not really motivate myself to go to the classes, to do my studies. And I nearly got kicked out of school twice, out of university twice. Very close, very close to not being able to finish my, my bachelor's degree. And then one thing happened in one of my classes, we had a course that was about systems thinking. And this course used this book, which is called the fifth discipline as uh, the textbook. And I started reading this book. Um, this is this is back in early 2000s. Um, and I started reading this book. So, oh my God, for the first time in my life as a student, something started to resonate with me. Something was making some sense. So, oh, finally. I can read something at school that I can use in my everyday life. And this was a very important breakthrough in my life as an individual, as a learner. It 
it made me interested. So I was a, I was a flunking student, just flunking a course after another. Then I became for the last two terms of uh, two semester at the university, I was a top student because I wanted to finish my studies, my bachelor's degree as soon as possible, and then go do a master's degree, which is more focused on this topic. And this was something that I kept working on afterwards as well. In my PhD, I pursued this. And uh, one correct, uh, the moral of the story is that one correct course can change life of the students. If something is meaningful, if something is in, enables them to make meaningful connections and to do some sense making when it comes to their, um, let's say, experiences and observations in life, that can be life changing. So that's, that's something that we have been focusing a lot at UBIS on that we create courses that are meaningful for the students and it equips them with some set of skills that are not um, otherwise, let's say, available to them through the conventional modes of, um, let's say, teaching or the courses that exist. Now, two questions for designers is that how can we see meaningful similarities across seemingly different phenomena? How can we see connections between phenomena that are distant in time and space? How can we understand these connections, especially now with the, with the COVID-19? We see that there is no boundaries. The concept of boundaries that we put around countries is, is really theoretical. Because if there was boundaries, we wouldn't worry if something would happen in China in terms of, uh, let's say, a pandemic. So there's a boundary. There's a border. It's not going to pass. But we saw that. Um, there is no boundaries. And when it comes to science and when it comes to learning, the same thing applies. There is no boundaries. So the fact that you put a, a course in a silo, so this is about marketing, this is about finance, this is about project management, this is wrong. The boundaries between courses and between disciplines need to disappear to enable learning for the students, transformative learning. I also have a second but to share with you. First but was that um, design is interdisciplinary. If you recall, I said about, I talked about the relationship between craft, science, um, as well as art. And, and we see that education is not equipping us with this. Second thing is that education is making us um, more like consumers of existing tools. There is this story that I like a lot it's about a person who used to sell a product which, used, which, which was called uh, the guaranteed cockroach killer. So if you paid the money, you would receive two blocks and an instruction which said place cockroach on, on block A. And then the second instruction was hit cockroach with block B. So most of the, most of the things that we learn about the tools that, and the frameworks that are fed to us, spoon fed to us at school, are more or less like this. All right, you have a problem. Don't worry, there's this framework for you. And we have all these frameworks and processes. The funny thing is that design thinking, design and creativity is something that is by discipline, by definition, should allow freedom. But then if you confine it to a five-step process, okay, start with this, then that, then this, then that, where does the creativity go? Where does that mystical and mysterious notion of connecting to the unknown go if everything is clear cut then we have all these tools oh yeah you don't do marketing there is the four p's and then it becomes the five p's now there's i don't know nine p's how many p's and um the other the other concepts that start with a word that doesn't start with a p uh the letter of the alphabet that starts uh, with a w for instance or an x or a b doesn't get a chance to be in these frameworks because it's all about feeding students with memorizable chunks of information, something that they can remember. Now, is it useful really? Can I do something practical with that stuff in real life? No one cares. Five forces model. You know, it's, it has to be five, it has to be four, it has to be nine blocks. You wanna design a business, here it is, a template for you to fill out. You don't need to think, just put a post-it on some of those blocks and that will be it. Um, you can you have designed a business, but those who have done the task, they know designing a business is by no means, um, let's say, as simplified 
as just putting post-its on, uh, let's say, on a piece of paper. It's the same way that you draw an organization chart and you put a box there. It's okay, this guy is responsible for this thing. That doesn't mean anything in reality. You know, the, the, the fact that you, you draw a box and put someone's name on it does not really mean that that person is going to perform his duties well. That person is going to contribute to the well-being of the company, the, uh, let's say, creativity of his subordinates, and the smooth, let's say, transition of work between him and the, pe and the people who are at the same level in the hierarchy. So this is what is happening. So two more questions. How do we know what we know? So next time that you think about some of the tools and frameworks that you have in mind, you can ask yourself, how do I know this stuff? Where does it come from? Or you can ask yourself, how can I create thinking tools and learning devices? I don't necessarily have to consume what already exists. What I can do is basically uh, develop my own tools, develop my own devices, something that is suitable for the purpose that I am pursuing and is not necessarily something that is already built and developed and is ready off the shelf and waiting for you to pick up and use. So this notion of mass production that has started with mass producing stuff, the fact that uh, let's say a factory can make a, a high quality car, a quality that has a more consistency, a lower price compared to a car that is built in, let's say in a workshop, this idea of mass, mass production tools, which is started in the early 19, 1900s, got, became, became very successful in producing some, some sort of products. We have to admit that. It, it cut the prices and so on and so forth. But then this idea, which was successful in one field, got transposed onto some other fields in which that was not necessarily a good idea to go towards mass production, like education is one of them. They're just mass producing things. We're creating one tool, one idea out there for millions of people to use. And this is killing individuality of people. The only thing that differentiates us from other species is being an individual, being unique. And that uniqueness can result into creativity and inspiration for others. Um, I think I've done around, around 30 minutes so um, what I, what I want to do is that I, I can stop here and I can, um, let me see if I can stop sharing. Uh, I, can, I can stop here and I can see if you got some questions to ask, if there is something that you want to know, you're curious about up to this point. I have another uh, 10, 15 minutes, I reckon. If I'm not wrong, if I'm not right, please remind me, Ina. Do I have uh, another 10, 15 minutes or, or what? Yeah, you'll if have 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay, beautiful. I got 15 minutes. I can show you some other stuff. I have some other stuff to share with you. But I wanted to make this pause to see um, if there is something that you want to know, if you have a question up until this point, if something does not make any sense, or you want a clarification on something, I'll be very happy to do that. In the meantime, I can also get a drink. Please put your questions in the chat box. Um, if you have some, I'm going to wait a couple of more minutes. If there isn't any questions, I'm going to go ahead with the rest of my presentation. Anyone? No one, apparently. Anybody? Here wants to know something more? Okay. Daniel is saying, hi, hi, Daniel. Good to have you on board. I also saw that a couple of uh, my students are here listening to this presentation. Um, I'm glad I, I have also Nicholas here from Croatia. Nicholas is supposed to be starting uh, a DBA with me at some point. Uh, we still don't know when this is gonna happen, but I have some of my students from Nigeria and some of my uh, my colleagues from um, UBIS as well. So Daniel has a question. How do you think education should change to fit to a more systemic way? Very good. Very good question. Um, I think 
to answer that question, we have to go towards problem-based education, you know, instead of topic-based education. Instead of saying now we have this topic or that topic, we say, okay, what problem do we want to solve? Let's talk about a problem. Let's talk about a project we want to do, okay? Because if you want to address a problem, then you cannot divide it into, you know, silos and stuff like COVID. Can you say COVID-19 is a problem, is a global problem? Is it only about health? No, it's not only about health, it's about economy as well. So just having an idea about health and looking at it from the point of view of, let's say, medicine is not enough. Looking at it through economic lens only is not enough. Looking at it um, from cultural point is also important because we saw in some countries the cultural disposition of, of people resulted in different, uh, let's, let's say, waves of outbreak of COVID. So suddenly you realize, oh my God, this is, this is much more complex than something that is a health-related problem. It's something that deals with economy. It deals with, uh, let's say, geography. It deals with culture. And at the same time, it deals with humanity because what are, um, what are, what are the things that are basically our freedom? And it's taken away from us because of this. So that's also another dimension to it. So you can you can see that one problem that exists right now, it has all these dimensions. And the the our inability to manage these problems is a symptom of lack of an educational system that can equip us with the with the frameworks, with the mindset that we can use to somehow address and understand the dynamic and complex nature. Of, of such phenomena. So I would say problem-based uh, learning is the best way of approaching it. So go ahead, create um, an idea, turn it, turn it into a prototype and sell it to, fun, to one customer. Go do something about this. By doing this, you need to learn about marketing, you need to learn about, um, let's say, sales, you need to learn about psychology of people, right? You know, to be a project manager in order to make sure that it comes out on time and so on and so forth. By that, you will learn how to do this. I have one story to share with you, something pretty cool from one of my favorite systems thinkers, who's called Russell Acuff. He said he and his team went to a, a very um, poor region, neighborhood in the U.S., where the students at the primary school had a tough time learning how to read. They didn't, they were not, they couldn't read the people, the students there. After many years of being in school, in classes, they couldn't read. He said, what we did was that we transformed one of the rooms in the school into an amphitheater. You know, we put a projector there, some seats, some chairs for the students to sit. And we started projecting Charles Chaplin's movies 24-7. 24-7. All the time students could go in there, they could see there was a Charles Chaplin movie. It says after a few months, their reading skills improved drastically because they wanted to know what is written between the scenes. Have you seen a Charles Chaplin movie? There is some, it's mute. So you can sit there first, you don't worry, but you know, there's nothing to worry about. But then afterwards, there's a panel with some text in it. Oh my God, one sentence, not a lot, but that's a key sentence. You have to understand that sentence in order to be able to see what's happening next. So. That small thing created this motivation for the people to go learn. We lack these type of simple but effective initiatives when it comes to education. So, Daniel, I hope I could answer your question to some extent. Take care of yourself. Um, don't go out too often. <laughs> then, we have, um, then we have another question from Marina. Yeah, it's very good that you can't go out. Daniel is saying that you can't go out. So Marina is asking, what are the ways to create something that doesn't exist yet? Beautiful question. Very nice. How can we create something that doesn't exist? Something that is unique, I believe. What Marina is asking here is about uh, creating something unique. Marina, where are you? 
where are you from? Where are you based right now? Can you just write a sentence about yourself, where you're from, and know you? So if you can just write a couple of sentences down there, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna answer your question. I actually have a couple of slides. Ah, you're from you're from Moscow. Okay, cool. All right, I have I have a slide to show you, um, to tell you where do we catch the idea for creation of unique stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, people are getting a little bit worried because I'm, I'm getting warmed up now and there's nothing more dangerous than a teacher who is warmed up because then you cannot uh, stop him from speaking. I'm going to go back to my slides. I'll just continue for another five minutes and then I'll, uh, I'll try to stop. I'll, tr I'll, try my, I'll try my best to, to stop after five minutes. If I don't, just shout out, okay, you know, and, and remind me that I have to stop. Okay, I'm going to try to answer Marina's question a couple of slides. Hopefully, it's going to work. It was actually the next thing to talk to you about. This is it. The next thing I wanted to share with you was where do design ideas come from? Where do ideas come from? How can we catch a unique idea for something? It could be a drawing. It could be a painting. It could be, let's say, um, some lines of poetry it could be a product it could be a service there's design to it okay in some of my classes i do this experiment i give this line to participants of a course and i ask them okay this is the beginning of a drawing complete the drawing and they come up with all sorts of weird designs that are all based on that first line incredible they are very different, you know, look at them. Some of them about nature, vacations, about women, men. There's a lot of nature, mountain, uh, musical instruments. That Most of the themes that come out are women, female figures, nature, musical instruments. Are These are really the top things. So this shows that at the bottom of all this diversity, there is a unity between the way people think. So there is something guiding us from down below. Um, I'm gonna pass on that previous slide, but here it is. Where do ideas come from? Go to your childhood. If you can go back to your childhood, that's the land, that's the wonderland of ideas. If you can connect your dreams, that's the wonderland. If you can have spontaneous artistic expressions, just letting go, without the fear of being judged by other people. That's the land of wonderful ideas for you. That's connecting to that rich and important field from which there is infinite opportunities for ideas for design. So you have to be able to somehow touch base with the child inside you. Um, something from Maria Rilke is a very famous Austrian poet. He's giving some uh, advice to a young poet who sends him his verses to see if his verses are good. He says, don't ask me. That's the wrong place to look. You have to ask yourself whether this is meaningful to you or not. And if you run out of ideas, what you got to do is go to the images of your dreams. Go to your childhood. That treasure house of memories, you know. There is something unique and beautiful and magical about our childhood that we lose it as we grow up. There's this sentence by Joseph Campbell. It says, we, use, we lose the childhood magic in the world of masks. It's beautiful and very powerful. In the world of masks, we use that childhood magic. Drop the masks, go back to the magic of the childhood. That's where you can, feel, you can see infinite possibilities. Unfortunately, what we see around us is that people... This is how people talk about themselves now. This is a friend of mine, his LinkedIn profile. He did his PhD in the same lab where I did my PhD. I look at his profile, I have no damn idea what this person is capable of because everything has become an abbreviation, you know? Things are moving away from meaning, moving away from that magical stuff. It's everything is becoming a meaningless, abbreviation that doesn't really mean much to many people. So um, that's the last questions I have for you. 
Last three questions. Where do thoughts come from? Where do your thinking, where does your thinking come from? Where are you between two thoughts? Where are you? Can you stop thinking for a second? Can you imagine not having any thoughts? Can you do something that your thought, flow of thoughts stops? And what are you between two thoughts? If you can ponder uh, about these questions um, and remember that source of all these ideas, the childhood, that treasure house of childhood memories, you know, where we were not thinking much, when we were absorbed in the moment, living at the, at the present moment, we didn't notice the passing of time. Um, that's the place to go to find a unique idea for something that does not exist yet. Otherwise, most of the things that we see in business schools and business classes is, all right, there is two companies. One of them is doing this stuff. The other one is doing that stuff. My idea is basically combining these two together. You know, most of the things are somehow rehashing, recombining, augmenting, improving existing stuff. No one talks about this uh, world of ideas that if you can tap into, you can come out with uniqueness. So that will be my uh, last thing to share with you. I'm going to stop my presentation here. And that's, I think, in a very good timing, I would say, because um, I have still like thank, one or two minutes you, left, <laughs> right? Enough? Yeah, by, by Swiss tradition, we are um, running out of time. And I hope uh, yeah. still uh, uh, we can say a few words about uh, the last things uh, that uh, University of Business and International Studies has created in connection to your presentation. Uh, I can uh, promise to people to take to Charlie Chaplin Museum as soon oh. as they will be our students. Very nice. I'll come. I'll come. Yeah, it's just uh, next to Geneva in Veve, you know, just uh, 65 kilometers away. Uh, uh, I just uh, put uh, to our chat uh, the message uh, that uh, we started online converse uh, conversations and consultations free of charge for people who would like to discuss their career opportunities. And uh, you can register it uh, through our website and uh, we will get back to you. Our career coach, uh, who is our campus director, will connect you uh, and uh, propose two uh, dates uh, uh, and time available uh, for this uh, consultation. You just need to upload your CV and uh, spend a minute time in uh, uh, putting information to the Google form. Uh, the second uh, announcement from uh, admission team here in Geneva, uh, we started early bird application to the September intake. Let's say in April and May, people who registered, uh, we will be given 20% of discount to these people uh, for all the um, studies that we propose, bachelor, master and uh, doctorate of a business administration degree. Uh, I would like to announce also that uh, last month uh, the UBIS article uh, uh, was published in a Turkish magazine in, for people who would like to read uh, about our university in the Turkish language. You can go and check this magazine thanks to our partners that we much appreciate. And uh, while we have this quarantine time and lockdown in Switzerland, uh, we are stopping our uh, marketing efforts and uh, promotion of events, uh, webinars like this that you are participating in. And I see here people all over the world, not only candidates, but also people who graduated already and participated in Arash class before. This is very a good opportunity for us to catch up with alumni. And um, this shows how much uh, people are connected to the institutions and to their professors, no matter uh, what is their career path. But this is what people are coming for Geneva, uh, to create a good network for all the lifelong uh, with uh, the professors, with the team of academics and uh, working professionals that we have on campus. Uh, we started... Um, um, chats and consultations also through the study portals and educations.com. Uh, I advise people uh, book the appointments with our 
admission team and we will have uh, individual consultations for each person and we will help you in each step of uh, visa application in this time of uh, uh, quarantine. I wish you everybody to have a good health and if you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask by email or by uh, this chat. Uh, we are happy to have you and uh, I hope uh, you and families, you stay guys healthy. Uh, try to keep in a good mood and uh, just by human relationships, uh, uh, do not uh, lose uh, people who are important for you. Stay in touch and uh, we will be welcoming new students on campus uh, in September. In case you are interested in online courses, we can start anytime like in May, in June and uh, for online applications, we are more flexible. Thank you for your time and attention. Uh, um, Arash and Inna, thank you very much for your participation. It was a great uh, presentation, very insightful. Uh, take care. Thank you for organization. We have today a record of participants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very happy about that. <laughs> have a good day. Bye. Bye. Bye.